Hello, good morning, good to see you. It's very good to be with you. Um, thank you to Stefan for organizing this. I am uh, Dr. Sean Henson, as you can see on the slide. Um, I teach in the Faculty of Theology and Religion. I lecture in science and religion, and uh, I'm a part of the Ian Ramsey Center as well. And uh, today I'm going to talk about um, fighting pandemics and life of faith from an Anglican perspective. Uh, and I've entitled what I'm going to say, For Queen Country and COVID-19, the Anglican Response to the Global Pandemic. And this is what I'm going to cover um, in the 30 minutes allotted. Uh, just a brief introduction about what I'm going to say, the parameters of, of what I will do. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Church of England. Who is it and what is it we're talking about when we say the Church of England, the Ecclesia Anglicana, which is, of course, more ancient than the post-Reformation Church of England. I'm going to talk about reactions to Church of England leadership. So I'm going to give you a couple of snapshots. By the way, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to talk about reactions to Church of England leadership, uh, how the leadership handled the pandemic, what people thought about this. And then I'm going to talk about the two broad wings of the Church of England, the Anglo-Catholic wing, as it's called, and the Evangelical wing. Uh, reactions by uh, clergy, but also by adherents, by ordinary worshiping members. And then some very brief constructive viewpoints before a conclusion. And so uh, COVID-19, which we all know to be a highly infectious uh, virus, was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization on 11 March 2020, uh, almost two years ago this week. On 23rd March 2020, of course, exactly two years ago, two days ago, this past Wednesday, the government in England, as a measure to control the spread of the virus, which was quickly clearly spreading, imposed a lockdown of all England, the entire country. Uh, the very next day, acting in haste, uh, acting very promptly, uh, 24th March 2020, which would have been yesterday, two years ago, the Church of England prescribed the closure of all of its churches. All churches closed, and they stated on their website this, uh, the archbishops and bishops of the Church of England have written collectively to clergy through their diocese, urging them now to close all church buildings other than when they are needed to keep a food bank running, but even then under strict limits. There will be no church weddings until further notice. Uh, funerals will not take place inside church buildings, and the only baptisms will be emergency baptisms in hospital or home. While the churches were closed, Church of England clergy were instructed to live stream, which uh, I think probably we're all used to uh, if not doing, at least seeing other people do. Um, clergy were instructed to live stream worship from their own homes, church buildings being closed not only to parishioners but even to clergy. Um, there will be, uh, let's see, uh, not even private prayer by priests was allowed in church buildings and churches were later allowed to open, thankfully, uh, for at least private prayer from 13 June 2020 and then Again, thankfully, for congregational worship from 4th July 2020. Now, this is an image of our uh, leader, the leader of the uh, Church of England and the Worldwide Anglican Communion, uh, Archbishop Justin Welby. Just several weeks later from the lockdown on the 24th of March 2020, the lockdown of churches, that is, uh, Easter Sunday occurred. It was almost three weeks later. Uh, this is Archbishop Welby leading a Church of England uh, Eucharist online um, from what appears to be his kitchen in Lambeth Palace. That became an issue uh, later. Uh, people were very critical of why the Archbishop, who by the way has uh, a wonderful um, uh, chapel in his palace, why he chose to do this from his kitchen table, a point of discussion. Um, more on the way in which people reacted to that particular episode later. Now, uh, this is, you might recognize this person. Uh, this is me. Um, I live in, I, I work in Oxford full time, but I live just outside of Oxford. Um, because I am, in addition to being an academic, an ordained priest, I joined in with the local rector uh, doing services from my home. That's my living room, my front room at home. 
Uh, and this was the, the first Sunday of Easter, so it's the Sunday after Easter Sunday, uh, holding not at my kitchen table, uh, but at a, uh, an altar which I had made uh, from implements brought to my home. Um, so across the country, people like myself, people like this person, this is the rector of Woodstock and Bladen, which is some 10, 12 miles um, west of Oxford, northwest. Uh, we, um, in response to the government, in response to church rulings, um, and really the advice was not just advice, but we understood it to be a form of requirement by law that we were not allowed uh, to do these things in our churches. Priests and associate priests like myself led services from, again, our homes. Likewise, across the country, uh, also in response to government rulings, uh, the policy was to close not only churches, but uh, all non-essential retail, business, and leisure venues, uh, in addition to the churches with the population instructed to stay home, uh, including wherever possible to work from home. So we, beca we became quite accustomed to working from home. Uh, as a result, in April 2020, 46.6%, uh, so almost half of the population uh, in employment did some work at home, and the majority of these, 86%, did so as a result of COVID-19. Likewise, during the first spring 2020 lockdown, 24%, uh, just a bit over that, uh, of businesses temporarily closed because of COVID-19-related restrictions, although the impact was felt differently across different industries. 82.2% uh, of those associated with the arts and entertainment and recreation closing uh, compared to 5.1% of those associated, for example, with information and communication. Uh, the government slogan, uh, which we heard, I think, every day, uh, there was a briefing in the afternoon on the television and radio. Uh, the government slogan was this, stay home, protect the NHS, which is the National Health Service, save lives. Uh, the decision, of course, by the Church of England uh, to close churches in March 2020 took place within this larger context of a major public health challenge with difficult decisions being made at great pace and uh, certain measures being deemed as necessary. The Church of England took the action to close at a time when understanding of the disease was, of course, very limited. Uh, we could see that people were becoming very unwell, the disease was spreading, uh, frequently changing in relation to the risk, factors posed to different sectors of the population. Uh, information on transmissibility of the virus was limited, as well as, of course, ways to control and contain it. And so we were all uh, feeling, I think it's fair to say, a bit shell-shocked and trying to protect ourselves and the general public, and in this country, the National Health Service, as well as we could. Uh, yet, whatever the obvious uh, dangers were, we knew there were dangers, the decision to close churches was not without controversy, I can tell you. As we shall see, I'll show you some of the decisions, uh, some of the opinions of ordinary churchgoers to this type of uh, closure of churches. There was a great deal, in fact, of caustic uh, criticism of church leadership, including our archbishop and both archbishops, as well as bishops and others. Uh, most of the Church of England uh, adherents um, seemed apparently happy to follow the government's and Church of England's leadership guidance, from my experience, um, in also a local parish church, again, helping out from time to time, as I still do, uh, once a month or so, sometimes less than that. Um, this is a country, after all, I think it's fair to observe, in which it has been said that people are happy to queue, uh, that is, to line up for public transportation. For example, reactions apparently still mixed by context and even according to one's variety of churchmanship. And I'll show you this as well in the Church of England. More details on these things to come. Uh, churchmanship, that is how one, I mean, there is a great deal of variety in the Church of England, uh, how one prefers to worship according to, to liturgical traditions and preferences is, again, in this country, diverse, although not impossible to categorize for the purposes of this presentation. Still, it would be uh, inaccurate, it would be unfair to speak of a Church of England response to the pandemic as if this was a totally uniform thing, as if everybody responded in the same way, given the fact of Anglican uh, diversity. So therefore, what I would like to do in the time remaining 
is uh, give you, in effect, three perspectives. These are snapshots of how the very diverse Church of England reacted to uh, the pandemic. Three lenses uh, into the Anglican response to the pandemic, including these. I'm going to tell you something about the reactions from lay people, uh, primarily from church rural contexts, which is the majority of Church of England churches, 60% or so, maybe just less than 60% of Church of England churches uh, are rural, uh, such as the churches where I live and help out in once in a while. So something about that, then something about reactions from Anglo-Catholic clergy, and then something about reactions from evangelical clergy. And these, again, are the two largest um, sections of people, clergy, in the Church of England. Um, so we're going to talk first about the Church of England in just a little bit more detail. What is the Church of England? What am I talking about? I think there are matters of orientation that help to set uh, the tone for how the Church of England reacted to the uh, pandemic. Uh, we are here today in this gathering um, in the Maths Institute, a multi-denominational, multidisciplinary, uh, and multinational audience. So I think it's safe to assume that not everybody will have the same uh, variance of understanding of the Church of England, its history, and factors that will have had some bearing on uh, any collective or contextual response to the pandemic. So put unconscionably briefly, uh, then first a quick review of what I am talking about when I say Church of England. Uh, these matters, as I say, of orientation, um, conditioning, as they did a certain response to the pandemic. And this orientation includes an ancient uh, Catholic foundation, um, but an English Reformation history from the 16th century. Uh, also, the unusual situation of being a national state church of England. This is a state church uh, working closely in connection with uh, the monarch, now the queen, Queen Elizabeth II, who was head of the church, and uh, the latter set of factors leading to a unique positioning also to the wider church and society, all of which speaks to quite, I think, a unified, it seems to me, national mindset. There is a sense of uh, being part of a national church, of responsibility uh, to even society. So very, very briefly, again, unconscionably briefly, I'm uh, doing uh, what I've heard one philosopher say is a bit of violence to history uh, by doing this so quickly. Uh, but the Ecclesia Anglicana, the uh, Church of England dates back, of course, to the Roman Catholic Church's influence in Europe as early as the second century, and especially in this country since the arrival in England of the first Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, St. Augustine of Canterbury, at the end of the sixth century, when, of course, the Church of England was still Catholic, Roman Catholic. Even so, the Church of England's uh, distinctive identity can be said to have started during the Reformation, uh, in England in the 16th century, this is King Henry VIII on the left of this slide, famous not least for his many wives as he sought a male heir to the throne. Uh, he founded the Church of England as a Protestant sect separate from the Catholic Church and made himself on any succeeding monarchs the head of it. Um, Henry broke ties with the Pope in the 1530s after the Catholic Church refused to annul his marriage to his first wife, uh, Catherine of Aragon, who had failed to produce any sought-for male heir. Uh, and this, of course, on the right is our current monarch, Elizabeth II, who I think, uh, in my view, is a very, very good exemplary head of, of the Church of England. After all, it's uh, largely a ceremonial role, uh, even though the Queen does get involved in, say, the appointment of bishops and uh, regis professors in the university. I, I know one or two who tell me they remember getting their letter from the Queen saying they'd been chosen for a Regius professorship at Christ Church. Um, so we have here uh, a very rough snapshot of what the, Engl uh, the Church of England looks like as far as gover governance goes. Uh, so technically, uh, the monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, at present the supreme governor. Then there is the Archbishop of Canterbury, primate of all England, and indeed the head of the worldwide Anglican Communion. Also in charge, so to speak, of the southern province of the church. There is an Archbishop of York, another Archbishop uh, in charge of the northern province. Then there are bishops. There are suffragan bishops who, in my experience, do a great deal of the work. I mean, the suffragan bishop of Oxford has a much larger area to cover than even the bishop of Oxford. Uh, then there are deaneries, 
subdividing the church. Uh, for example, where I live is called the Woodstock Deanery, and then there are vicars or rectors, and I've shown you a picture of the rector of Woodstock in Bladen. And this system covers around 12,500 separate parishes. Uh, there have been church movements which have had a um, distinct impression upon the governance and the history of the church. The Puritan movement of the 17th century led to English civil wars and uh, the Commonwealth. During this time, the Church of England uh, and the monarchy were quelled, but both were reestablished in 16, uh, 1660. Then there was the evangelical uh, movement of the 18th century, uh, and you will have heard, I think, of figures like John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, who was an Oxford a academic as well as an Anglican priest. Um, and um, uh, conversely, there was later in the 19th century, the Oxford movement started here in Oxford, hence being called the Oxford movement uh, in this city, uh, with such figures as the now sainted John Henry Newman, highlighting uh, the Roman Catholic heritage of the church. These two movements and their philosophies I'll touch upon in just a little more detail. Um, pertinent for today, these Anglo-Catholic and evangelical groups have reacted differently, very markedly differently to the pandemic, which has something to do with differences in theology and differences in what, uh, by this theology, they consider to be important. I think also, I would argue, I mean, I, I spend most of my time lecturing in the history and uh, present-day interactions between sci the sciences and religion. So I, I lecture in science and religion. And I think there's a particular uh, scientific orientation which I see in the Church of England. Uh, historically, and again in my experience, uh, a, a great receptivity, a reception, a receptive orientation to science, to scientific research and advancement, and thus to social and medical care as mainstays of English society. Uh, more on that also as we continue. This is Roger Bacon. Uh, we get with Roger Bacon, who was in Oxford. He was a Franciscan friar. Uh, the beginnings of uh, empirical thinking. He thought about, of course, he was a Franciscan friar, so he thought about experience of God. He also thought about another kind of experience, which we've come to call empirical experience. He uh, died in the year 1292. Um, we, get, um, we get really the... Um, modern scientific method from another Bacon, Francis Bacon. I didn't know that they were related in any way. I like to have fun with students talking about the two Bacons and um, usually saying something like one of them invented bacon that we eat and just to see their reaction. Uh, but Francis Bacon, an English uh, philosopher and statesman who served as Attorney General, as Lord Chancellor of England, uh, his works are seen uh, as contributing to what we now recognize uh, in truth, as the scientific method. Uh, he remained uh, influential, his work on the what we call now the scientific method through the later stages of the scientific revolution. Bacon, uh, Roger Bacon, of course, was a devout Roman Catholic Franciscan, but uh, Francis Bacon, who died in the year 1626, uh, a devout Anglican, again, has been called the true father of empiricism. Uh, I'll mention uh, very briefly one other, John Wesley, who I mentioned just several sentences back, several paragraphs back, I suppose. Uh, the, the Oxford Academic and Anglican Priest. This is a book that uh, John Wesley wrote called Primitive Physic, um, An Easy and Natural Method of Curing Most Diseases. He was um, scientifically orientated. He was a, uh, a, a, an academic at Lincoln College in the University of Oxford. And uh, he said he did thousands of experiments, usually using himself as uh, the so-called guinea pig of what might work to cure various ills. And uh, so he wrote this book, and the idea, and this was, of course, before the National Health Service, the idea was to put this book into the hands of, of common people who had no quick and easy means of, of treating illnesses and diseases. They could look through, throughout this book, see what to do when you have this, that, or the other ailment, and again, Wesley, uh, in fact, I have a facsimile of this book, uh, a contemporary facsimile, which, which looks like the older uh, volume printed in, in the 1740s originally. Uh, and it, it often says at the end of an experiment or at the end of a treatment, tried. And what Wesley is saying is, I've tried this. And as far as I'm concerned, it works. 
Uh, now, the NHS, uh, when formed in uh, 1947, incorporated many of the principles of the Christian church, it has been observed. It was seen as a, quote, extension of the kind of Christian project that we had in this country, which was about caring for people from the cradle to the grave. This is Professor Linda Woodhead, a sociologist of religion for many years at Lancaster. She's now at King's College, uh, London. And uh, she says that as far as she's concerned, chaplains in hospitals, for example, uh, uh, Anglican priests in hospitals she's speaking of, are even more successful than everyday clergy because they are seen as caring for everybody, regardless of whether a person is religious or not. Uh, and so they sort of get license to talk about being spiritual as, as a part of the care of persons. And essentially, they get away with it, is what Linda Woodhead would say. Now, all of that leads to uh, these images. This is, uh, I don't know if you've been to Litchfield Cathedral, a very beautiful cathedral. It's uh, less than 100 miles north of here, north of Birmingham. And uh, cathedrals like Litchfield, like Salisbury, and others became uh, vaccination centers during uh, the beginnings of the treatments, uh, the vaccinations across the country. No surprise, given what I've told you leading to this point, uh, people saw it as a good thing, generally speaking, uh, that Church of England cathedrals and other church properties became uh, these effective locations for the, for the vaccination campaign of the Church of England. Now, what about reactions to Church of England? Oh, and here are a few, few more images. Let me just go through these very briefly. Uh, here we go, somebody getting a vaccination in a cathedral. Again, this is old Litchfield Cathedral, the images. Um, there's another, people queuing up very politely, waiting their turn. Now, reactions, um, and I'm watching the time very carefully, to Church of England leadership, and then reactions by Anglo-Catholics and evangelicals. So what did people in the pews, so to speak, think of, for example, the image of the Archbishop of Canterbury doing a uh, Holy Eucharist on Easter Day at his kitchen table? Um, despite the rosy picture that I've painted so far of people queuing up, of uh, cathedrals like Litchfield being used as uh, wonderful vaccination centers, and all of that was and has been and still is very positive, um, uh, there is, uh, it's fair to say, uh, a lot of criticism of what has happened. Uh, Coronavirus Church and You was an online survey promoted through the Church Times. The Church Times is a national church newspaper. Uh, you can see it online as well. You can look that up. Uh, some things are free if you don't subscribe. In a number of dioceses around the country, it ran beginning in May 2020, offering a snapshot of varied opinions of Anglican leadership during the pandemic. Uh, the tally of responses finally was just shy of 7,000, uh, of which uh, 5,347 came from people in the Church of England. Uh, analysis identified a number of issues and concerns, including a lack of quality leadership, uh, comparing themselves uh, with other churches than the Church of England, becoming irrelevant. Is the church becoming irrelevant by its response to the pandemic was the question problems associated with the closing of rural churches. Uh, rural churches, you see, are important hubs of communities, uh, not just places of worship, but people use them for all sorts of activities, and that's still very much true today. Uh, neglecting rural clergy, uh, marginalizing rural communities, using the kitchen table for Eucharists as opposed to a proper consecrated altar, and the importance of looking to the future. Um, uh, I won't, I, I haven't put purposefully, some of the, uh, the commentary is so acerbic, so sharp, I haven't put it on uh, slides. I'll read you just a couple of um, snapshots. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, uh, many worshipers, not just clergy, wanted to be connected with the spaces and places that meant much to them. Uh, one person evaluating this phenomenon has said, members of the church were now being offered alter alternative forms of prayer and worship via technologies not always familiar and not always welcome of uh, virtual services centered on clergy whose faces became personal avatars of worship. And of course, one had to sit and watch, if not a member of the clergy, the clergy taking um, the Mass, the Holy Communion, the Eucharist, whatever you prefer to call it, uh, while everybody else just said a prayer, this kind of reaction. 
Um, the results of this study, um, and again, here are some quotes. Uh, the church has, I feel, made a fantastic effort. This was just about the only positive comment, by the way, that I found uh, among the comments. The church has made a fantastic effort in rapidly providing modern worship alternatives with online services and virtual meetups. I think on a local and national level, the church response has been highly appropriate. This was a female in her 50s. Um, other comments included these. Uh, embarrassing lack of leadership from the archbishops, unsurprising, but embarrassing nonetheless. This was a female also in the 50s. Um, nationally, another said, the Church of England has seemed wholly absent at a time when the voice of the church should have been transmitted loud and clear. From my perspective, there seems to have been a wholesale failure of leadership. The previous very high regard that I had for Archbishop Welby has evaporated. Somebody said, where has he been? Uh, somebody also said, why on earth uh, did the Archbishop of Canterbury celebrate Easter in his kitchen uh, when there is a chapel in Lambeth Palace? Did he think he was being matey and down to earth? No sense of spirituality. Uh, the Last Supper took place in an upper room, not Martha and Mary's kitchen. This was another female, um, this, in this case, in, in her 70s. Uh, a final positive note, uh, and again, very carefully watching the time, uh, somebody said this, looking to the future. Uh, my faith in Almighty God, our Creator, remains strong and firm. No thanks to the Church of England, letting us down so badly. Acting in an unnecessarily fearful and a cautious manner, no trust in God, that all will be well. In other words, when put to the test, they failed. That's pretty uh, caustic, isn't it? At least faith in God was preserved. Now, finally, in um, 120 seconds, uh, a comparison briefly um, uh, in the way in which the Anglo-Catholic wing of the church and the evangelical wing uh, reacted differently. Uh, as mentioned earlier, within this one church, the Church of England, uh, there's a great deal of variety, um, holding together in tension mostly two distinctive streams. One, the Catholic tradition, uh, which harkens back to the original Roman Catholic roots of the Church of England, and one rooted in the 16th century and following Reformed tradition. And I'll just show you... Uh, I'm going to skip over that for the sake of time. Just show you a couple of tables. Uh, and we, I, I can, by the way, uh, and would be very happy to share the tables with you if you wish to write me. And um, uh, I can um, send these to you. Uh, so you see on the left at the top, uh, Anglo-Catholic clergy, and these are clergy responses and evangelical clergy. My denomination at the national level has responded well to the crisis. Evangelicals thought much more so positively than uh, Anglo-Catholics. Uh, the government responded well, about equal opinions. Uh, the NHS has responded well. I think most people seemed to think positively of the NHS response. Um, uh, churches, now the bottom of table two, churches in my area have responded well to the crisis, just about equal uh, accolades. Uh, closing churches was the right thing to do, and you see here beginnings of differences in theology. Uh, Anglo-Catholics in theology and practice value, we might say, holy things and holy spaces much more so uh, than apparently evangelicals. And this is based on responses. Uh, twice as many almost clergy should be allowed into their churches, Anglo-Catholics said, as compared to evangelicals. Um, and this trend continues. Uh, what are some, uh, and there, there were nine of these tables. Um, I'll just skip to the ninth. Uh, and this was a primarily positive response uh, of almost equal measure by both Anglo-Catholics and Evangelicals. Um, they didn't know if church life would soon return to normal. They said, we will appreciate better church as it normally is in the future, about equal numbers. Face-to-face -face contact will be valued even more than it was before, about equal numbers. Um, so uh, there were various conclusions. What we have done in this brief presentation is we've looked at three key matters, an overview of what and whom we mean when we say Church of England, which has included during the present pandemic a certain orientation to the Queen, uh, to the monarchy, uh, to society, to country, and even to, I would argue, scientific research. And we've looked at two key snapshots into the life of the Church of England, which have been reactions to the way in which the leadership has handled 
uh, the church's reaction to the pandemic. A clear single conclusion, I mean, it would be unfair really to summarize all of this into one single conclusion, but we could say one clear indication has crystallized, which is that in terms of uh, the church's worshiping community, consultation with all who worship, whether that changes in the end, a particular uh, policy or action is always a good policy. Thank you.